the Shark Deck. Hello, I'm Jenny Mack with your daily comedy news. Hey, Chris Rock, sorry to keep dragging you back in, but Jada Pinkett Smith has a new book coming out. She's doing the press. She talked about the slap and said, I thought this is a skit. I was like, there's no way that Will hit him. It wasn't until Will started to walk back to his chair that I even realized it wasn't a skit. The first words she said to Will once they were alone after the show were, are you OK? Has she spoken to Chris Rock? No, I haven't spoken to Chris. Well, do you have any desire to talk to Chris? Here's my desire. I just hope that all the misunderstanding around this could be cleared up and there can be peace. Was she offended by the joke? I mean, that's what comedians do. I would just have to say that I'm not really here to make any judgment on how people decide to express themselves and express their art. I'll say that several times I've had my feelings hurt for sure. I've had my feelings hurt a lot by Chris. But at the end of the day, too, being in the spotlight, it comes with the territory. Jada says she has not spoken to Chris since the night of the Oscars. She revealed that Chris Rock went off stage and went up to her immediately and said, Chris came down at the end of the stage and tried to apologize to me. He said, I didn't mean any harm. She said, I can't talk about this now, Chris. This is some old stuff. I thought this was about the Oscars in 2016 and the stuff that they had before I even came into the picture back in the late 80s. I got to leave that to Will and Chris to talk about, but they have their stuff for sure. Variety had some more about this and they reminded us. How Jada thinks the 2022 Oscars were about the 2016 Oscars. Back in 2016, Jada publicly protested the Academy Awards as part of the hashtag Oscars So White controversy. That year, the awards failed to nominate a single person of color in the four acting categories. Chris Rock was the host and even made a Jada protest joke in his monologue. Jada said, I probably should have called him and said, hey, are you OK? And just know that although I'm speaking about the Oscars, I do wish you the best. And I just want you to know that his feelings may have been hurt. After the 2016 Oscars, he apologized, and I apologized to him as well, so I actually thought we were good and that the hatchet was buried between us, and we hadn't talked since then until 2022 came. Oh, wait, but there's more. Jada said Chris Rock once asked her out while rumors were circulating about her possible divorce from Will Smith. Jada said, I think every summer all the reports would come out that me and Will were getting a divorce. And this particular summer, Chris, he thought we were getting a divorce. So he called me and basically was like, I'd love to take you out. And I was like, what do you mean? He was like, well, aren't you and Will getting a divorce? I was like, no, Chris, those are just rumors. He was appalled and he profusely apologized. And that was that. As part of this press, Jada has revealed that she has been separated from Will Smith since 2016. Fascinating. More from Gossip Corner. Sherry Shepard claims that Barbara Walters was caught having sex with Richard Pryor by Paul Mooney. You didn't think I was going to say any of those words, did you? No. (laughs) Sherry Shepard said, I've never told this before. I told Joy Behar that I'd run into Paul Mooney and Paul Mooney said he caught Barbara Walters with Richard Pryor. I came back and I was like, Joy, guess what? So apparently the day after this incident, uh, Barbara Walters walks in and Joy Behar goes, so you're schlepping Richard Pryor, huh? Barbara Walters turns around and goes, who told you that? Uh, Less salacious, but still on uh, Gossip Corner. Taylor Swift did a premiere of her Eras Tour concert film. By the way, for the latest Taylor Swift news, why don't you follow the podcast Taylor Swift Today? Guess what that podcast is about. Wherever you get your shows, Taylor Swift Today. I'll let the Taylor Swift people tell you about that. I'm bringing it up because you know who was there. Adam Sandler. Several viral clips. Viral might be a little uh, extreme, Johnny Mac. I'm not sure they're all that viral, but I saw at least three clips of Adam Sandler dancing at the premiere and remember this isn't a concert you're in a movie theater and adam sandler standing up and dancing speaking of adam sandler boy everything's rolling nicely today netflix released the first full trailer for the animated leo variety is describing this as an animated musical comedy what the cast includes bill burr i'm not familiar with bill singing too much cecily strong definitely has game jason alexander has game you might not realize it rob schneider joe coy And Sadie Sandler, Sonny Sandler, and Jackie Sandler, clearly three of the best actors available for those roles. Is Adam going to sing in this thing? I guess Adam can, like, sing in that Sandler-y way. We hear Sandler's Leo the Lizard saying, No animal wants to be locked up. I wasted my life. Leo debuts on Netflix November 21st. South Park released a trailer for Joining the Panderverse. I love this trailer. The AV Club did not love the trailer. Uh, Why would they not like it? And I liked it. Well, you'll have to watch it for yourself. But in South Park, joining the Panderverse, 
the main characters on South Park have been recast. Have you watched anything made in the last 10 years? You know how like things get recast. So Kenny, for example, no longer a little boy. South Park joining the Pandaverse out Friday, October 27th. Check it out. Pete Davidson will host Saturday Night Live. The promo for this week's episode shows Bo and Yang and Chloe Feynman hanging out at Studio 8H and they're catching up about the summer. Yang reveals he watched the entire series Suits. And they notice Pete Davidson is sitting there, and Pete says, My apartment's under construction, so I'm just living here. Chloe says that only cast or hosts are allowed in the studio, and Pete says, All right, I'll do that. I'll host. Pete was on The Tonight Show and said his mom is a good catch. She wants to help her find a boyfriend. He says mom's excited about this weekend's SNL. She's actually been on the show almost as many times as I have. Like, she's always ready to go up, but I'm really excited just because I'm trying to find my mom someone to date. She hasn't been with anybody in, like, 23 years, so, like, yeah, she's a good catch. Pete joked that the last time he was on Fallon, there was a writer strike. He said, it's funny, anytime I have something that I work really hard on that like I'm really proud of, either a national pandemic happens and they're like, no premiere for you, or this writer strike happens. The LA Times wrote about Skankfest. Remember I had commented that Skankfest had like zero press? Well, there's finally a big recap article about it. I have shared it on the Facebook group, Daily Comedy News Podcast Group. Please feel encouraged to join that group. It was nice to see this article. The Vibe writes the LA Times, part South by Southwest, part Comedy Club Funhouse. Six stages produced 14 hours of programming daily with the assist of 200 volunteers. The festival also included a tattoo studio, an outdoor wrestling ring, and nightly after parties at the Peppermint Hippo Strip Club. Stand-up comedian Omid Singh said, Skankfest was like one of those rock star fantasy camps for comedians. We were surrounded by some of the best and darkest comics and the fans loved them. Skankfest was founded in 2016. Rebecca Trent, who owns the Creek in the Cave comedy club that used to be out in Queens and now it's in Austin, Texas. She said, I got an email from Luis Gomez that said, we're doing a festival called Skankfest. That is all. Six weeks later, we delivered the first Skankfest with headliners Doug Stanhope, Sal Vulcano, Michael Che, Todd Glass, Big J Ogerson, Dave Smith, Rachel Feinstein, Ari Shafir, Kurt Metzger, Tim Dillon, Sam Real, Joe List, Mark Norman, Chris Stefano. That is a lineup. That lineup at the Creek in the Cave sold 300 tickets. Wow. wow. Listen to that lineup. 300 tickets. This year, uh, Skankfest had a stand-up series called The Los Angeles Raiders that brought out Brendan Schaub, Leonard Utz, Sam Tripoli, and Tone Bell. The Legends Room had Eddie Pepitone, Tom Rhodes, Harlan Williams. I haven't heard Harlan's name in a bit. And TJ Miller. TJ told the crowd, we did it, guys. We're almost done. If we can just make it to 3 a.m. without pooing on our pants or ending a marriage, it's a successful Skankfest. How many of you got tattoos? Round of applause. The LA Times writes, for now, Skankfest avoids major industry interference, clickbait panels, slick dealmaking, and fake award ceremonies not welcome. Eddie Pepitone said, Skankfest fans are the nicest, most appreciative fans. When I perform in L.A., it's like, go F yourself, get out of my way. At Skankfest, entire rooms chanted, Eddie, Eddie. <laughs> Today, if you like comedy albums, Todd Berry's Domestic Short Hair is released in audio format. That is currently the number one special of the year, as you know. The 10,000 Laughs Festival goes on today and tomorrow. Tonight, Dan Mintz, Ian Fidance, Sam Talent, Beth Stelling at 9.30, Kelsey Cook at 10.15. Tomorrow, a show that says, this show is in Russian and it says sold out. So I clicked on it and it says, for those of you who don't read Russian wondering, WTF this is, 10,000 Laughs has partnered with the local Ukrainian-Russian community and we're raising funds for the Protez Foundation, which you can find out more about here at a link they shared. So it's a Russian language comedy show. A partner in Churla at 7, that's cool. Beth Stelling also at 7, you're going to have to pick. 9.30, Kelsey Cook and Chad Daniels. That's a good show, too. And a bunch of ensemble shows. This looks like a really good festival. 10,000 laughs in Minneapolis. Very cool. So yesterday, I did a 20-mile run. Humble brag. So I listened to a lot of podcasts. Mark Marin had on Tom Papa. Fantastic. Make sure you listen to that one. And I, It was one of those, I do this every now and then, that was so good that I ran the transcript on it. And I pulled some stuff out of it that I'll share over the next few days. Marin started talking about crowd work and he said, I can do crowd work, but it's like, oh my God, like why spend a half hour doing it just so you get things to put and post up? Then Marin did a section talking about the death of Lynn Shelton, his girlfriend, and how it affected him. And it really resonated with me. I've shared on and off here. Uh, my mom has been pretty sick for the last few months and I have my ups and downs. And this segment just really struck with me. Uh, Marin said, I wouldn't say I'm comfortable with death yet because for me, I thought, who's going to get the cats? And someone's going to have to clean up because that's one thing I learned after Lynn passed away. 
what are we going to do with all this stuff? She had boxes of things. If you're a keeper of things, which I'm not even sure there's a point to, but I got boxes upstairs here with stuff I wrote in high school with things like art stuff and all this stuff. I don't really have any grand plan. Some people have offered to archive it, but because of my insecurity, it doesn't enable me to be like, yeah, you better get the stuff together because look, they've opened a Bob Dylan Center and who knows? But ultimately, it's you call in family members and you call in people to determine what that means. And really, a lot of the stuff we keep means something to us. It represents something of our past, something of our evolution. Maybe we think it deserves more attention than it once got, but ultimately it's part of us. And once that goes, unless you're a grand person of letters or something, it's a box that a family member is going to go through and go, I don't know what this is. Don't end on that, Johnny Mac. I won't. James Burroughs spoke to Deadline about the new Frasier and reminded us Frasier was meant to be a device to get Diane Chambers back into Cheers. It was a four show arc back in season three. But at the end of the first episode, we said, this guy's too funny and he fills a niche on the show that we don't have. It's lucky we kept him on because when Shelley Long left, Kelsey was able to make all those jokes that Diane did. He was a buffoon in Cheers. As for these days, Frazier looks the same and he acts the same. The character is eternal. People love him. He's a pompous ass, but he's played with incredible vulnerability, which makes him a character that people really like to spend time with. It's so much fun and so seamless. We have a shorthand that goes back almost 30 years, so I don't have to work hard to be able to direct him. My goal is just to make other people in the cast commensurate with Kelsey to play the same level he does. Otherwise, they're going to get washed off the stage. How will Frazier's character end, whether on this series or a different one? Burrow said, I'd like him to end up happy. That's my concern. A lot of things happen to that guy, but the nature of the character, Frazier can't win all the time. I'm hoping the character eventually ends up in a beautiful place. Rebecca Alter wrote for Vulture about the Frazier reboot. She took a different angle, talking about Frazier's big divorce energy. and Called it a reasonable justification for why Frazier in this revival would be wearing uncool, untailored jeans and white soled soft material sneakers that bear a song resemblance to Allbirds. He looks divorced as hell, but he doesn't look like Frasier. Sure, this reboot is setting Frasier to Boston for teaching position, and these Allbirds really do scream, average well-off Boston man, in the worst way. And it's been pointed out that Frasier wore jeans and casual ensembles in the OG series, but he really had to earn his denim threads, but he always paired it with yuppie chic sweaters and flannels. These jeans are paired with a blue blazer and sneakers and makes him look less like Frasier the Brilliant Fool and more like plain old Kelsey Grammer, the crappy Republican commentator. <laughs> Frasier should be entering this new chapter in his life with his best foot forward, and that foot should be clad in Armani loafers. Vulture did their 25 comedians you should know, and Jordan Jensen is one of them. And Jordan gave some pretty short answers. Worst show ever? The worst show ever I did was for two people on a rooftop with winds going at 50 miles per hour, only to find the audience members I was screaming at didn't speak English. Best comedy advice, worst comedy advice, best advice. It was right before I did my first show at a club, the manager walked by me and said, have fun. Jordan said, I haven't gotten bad advice, but the second best advice I've ever gotten is, you don't get to choose what kind of comedian you are. The nonprofit Stomping Ground Comedy Theater is holding a 48-hour laugh-a-thon tonight through Sunday on the main stage. The show will present 50 comedians and comedy groups and hopefully raise thousands of dollars in donations. They're hoping to raise 50 grand. James Hamilton released his new album, I Don't Deserve These Deals. Recorded live at Union Hall in Brooklyn, James has original and hilarious takes on helicopters, weekend wedding plus ones, mom smart algorithms, diet based scams, disease raps, and a podcast for when the aliens come from us. Let's take a listen. Good to see all of you. Happy to be here. Uh, Rojo was talking about people going to space. I um, spent a lot of time getting angry about billionaires going to space. Anybody else? <laughs> I think it's the thing we can all get upset about. <laughs> Jeff Bezos went to space for 11 minutes, and you know he came back like a dude who studied abroad for one semester. <laughs> Just like, I see the world differently, man. <laughs> I lived there for a little bit. Uh, and when you're up there, it's actually pronounced spots. <laughs> Paul Elia is taping his special, executive produced by Matt Reif, tonight and tomorrow at the Detroit House of Comedy. And a Sean Penn hostage comedy has been pulled due to the Israel-Hamas war. There's no U.S. distribution on Caught, and it's C-A-U-G-H-T with asterisks in the middle of the way they used to spell MASH. You know what I'm talking about there? Yes. The U.K. launch date has been delayed. ITV said, in light of current events, the launch date of Caught will be delayed until further notice. The six-episode show stars Sean Penn. It did stream in September in Australia, so we know that it follows four Australian soldiers sent on a mission to a war-torn country. They're captured by freedom fighters, and they produce a hostage video that goes viral. 
The hostages collaborate with their captors to produce a faked hostage video in which one of the freedom fighters pretends to bludgeon one of the captives with a machine gun. Sean Penn plays himself, specifically a version of himself who makes a fool of himself on Australian morning television. And that's your comedy news for today. Follow the show for free on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your shows. Tell a friend about it. See you tomorrow.